And I'm always surprised, I have to say, uh, I meet people who want to be authors, want to write, want to be published, but they're like, eh, proposal. They can't be bothered to write a 12-page proposal. So I just, if, if you're one of those people, understand that it's a lot easier to write a 12-page proposal than a, than a book. So if you can't commit the time and the focus to write a 12-page proposal, you should not be writing a book. And that's <laughs> just a simple common sense. And I, I was amazed how often people are like, eh, can't I just avoid the proposal? Um, I needed a title. I had a collection of essays about Canada, coming back to Canada. And uh, this was in the fallout after the referendum. There were all these books, Canada, Country Too Good to Lose, Canada, Why We Love You, 101 Reasons to Love Canada. Everyone was traumatized by the near-death experience of the 95 referendum. And about one in the morning, um, with my brother Ian, I came up, we came up with a title over one too many beers. The lesson in this is don't come up with a title uh, with my brother Ian <laughs> at one in the morning. Avoid that. Write that down. Keep that in your mind. Avoid doing that. Because he said to me, although I have to admit it did work out, because he said, uh, you know, everyone's writing these, like, I love Canada. You should say, I hate Canada. I said, well, I don't hate Canada. It would be funny, man. People would get the joke. I'm like, I, 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 just, I know. I call it Why I Hate Canadians. I said, you know what? That's kind of catchy. It's funny, right? Everyone will know it's a joke, right? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. Everyone will, everyone will know it's a joke. Um, so I put together the proposal, sample chapters, um, uh, and I needed, so for why I hate Canadians. It was sample chapters, a table of contents, outline, the usual, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I learned by reading this book on writing that there are two things, is that you needed to, again, this is pre-Google. You needed to send it to a real editor. You don't just send it into acquisitions because it'll end up in this horrible place called the slush pile, pile, pile. And you, you know, it's a fate worse than death, uh, apparently. So um, you did not want that, and you wanted to get it to a real editor. So here's, here's my stroke of genius. And I can pass this on to you because the doors are closed. And I'm hoping there's no publishers here today, that there's no acquiring editors in the room. Because um, this is how, how to get published in 1997, okay, <laughs> so, so this, is, this is how to do it. Um, first of all, there was two steps to my cunning plan. First of all, I, I needed the name of an editor, and a, a real editor, not what was listed in the book. There was a book called The Publishing in Canada or something, but I had been told don't. Th that, that's often they're fake names, uh, or they're people that is just an intern who just gets loaded down with slush. So they said, you've got to send it to a real person. So I thought, I don't know what I'll do. I'll just call up a publisher. I'm Irish. I'll just keep talking until I find the right guy. I'll just, I'll do it, man. I can just talk my way into this. So I, uh, I called up McLennan and Stewart. They were the big Canadian publisher at the time. Uh, now they're an imprint of uh, uh, Bertelsmann, I think. But uh, at the time, they were the Canadian publisher. Uh, so I phoned up, and I was like, ready. And it said, this is my first introduction to voicemail. It's like, hello, if... Uh, if you know the name of the party you wish to reach, and I thought, well, I don't know the name of the party I wish to reach. If I knew, and it said, uh, uh, enter that number now, or enter the first three letters of the name. And I thought, it's got to be a Smith, right? <laughs> so I typed S-M-I, and it said, we're sorry, we do not recognize that. Did you mean Schmidt, Alex, senior editor? I'm like, yes, <laughs> that's the guy. Old Alex, yes, Sh not Smith, Schmidt, I spelled it wrong. So, but I knew even then, so here's what I did, and uh, I ran into Alex years later, actually. And here's what I, I thought, well, now in step two, how do you avoid him just glancing at it? So here's what I did, and it works, is I, you know, they say write a, write a cover letter, like sweat over your cover letter, no typos, no grammar, sell it, you got three paragraphs, there's, all, there's entire books written on how to write a one-page, three-paragraph cover letter. Like, there's entire books on that. I didn't do any of that. I didn't write a cover letter. My address was on the title page. I figured that's enough. I took a paper, and I wrote in a big scrawl, Alex, here's the manuscript. Sorry it took so long, Will. <laughs> and then I mailed it in. So here's what happened. I found out later. Alex, that landed, Alex like, Will Ferguson, who the hell is that? It's, this has got to be a mistake. So he went room to room to, to different editors. Is this, I think I've got one of your authors. Did you have an author, Will Ferguson? Why, why I hate Canadians? What the hell is that? Let me see. They passed it around at meetings, and nobody could remember. Did we commission this? Did, I, <laughs> did we meet him at something? And, so, and then they said, well, we, we should probably make an offer on it. So uh, McLennan and Stewart called me up, 
And uh, I, was, I was quick on my toes because they, uh, they picked up the phone and they're like, hi, it's uh, Alex. Uh, how are you doing, Will? I'm like, good, hey, Alex, thanks for calling me. Like, I never gave it away that we never. And years, years later, years later, I finally met him face to face and he said, you know, Will, I'm embarrassed to tell you, like, I don't, when did we meet? I said, about five minutes ago, <laughs> about five minutes ago. So, um, so when they called me up, I, I immediately said, well, uh, you'll, uh, I should probably let my agent handle that. And then I hung up and I quickly started phoning agents and saying I have an offer. So uh, that was how I got Why I Hate Canadians, which was my first uh, book. And the, the, the title itself, like I said, it was meant to be a joke. Um, not everybody, uh, under, not my grandma. She didn't, uh, she didn't appreciate getting a book with that title. It was funny, I went over to her, her senior's residence and she had all the books and she had my book, like it was like Lady Shatter's, Shatterly's Lover or something. She had it turned spine in. Like, because it said, as well as porno or something, like, why I hate Canadians? So I was like, Grandma, and I pulled it out and I turned it over. I thought it was a mistake. The next time she had done it again. So, um, so my grandmother aside, um, most people understood uh, the joke, and uh, the power of a, of a title uh, is immense, as I had discovered. Um, I finally published, um, and the, the kind of the, the conceit behind that was you can't put the words hate and Canadian in a title. It's, and it's a point of pride. I think it's one of the, we're one of the few countries maybe Australia, where if you, put, if you call it that, people assume it's a joke. If you said why I hate the French or why I hate the Germans or why I hate the Americans or why I hate the British, it would have a real edge to it. But why I hate Canadians, they go, what? <laughs> what? And I think maybe Australia, you could call it but why I hate Australians and people might go, what? Um, and uh, people couldn't put the word hate like, and, uh, and Canadians in the same. And I finally published The Hitchhiker's Guide to Japan. That was my second book that I've been working on before the first one. Travel guides are a lot of work, as I found out. And it was, although it was edited in America, it was printed in, in Japan, and um, uh, the Japanese printer stopped it, because on the back cover it said, Will Ferguson is also the author of Why I Hate Canadians. <laughs> and they fixed it, so it's fixed. So even now, the book is out of print, but you can find it on A-Books easily. Even now, and I'd never corrected them, because it was great. The, the Japanese printers fixed that obvious mistake. So even now, the Hitchhiker's Guide to Japan, the bio reads, Will Ferguson is also the author of Why I Hate Comedians. <laughs> so, <laughs> which makes me look really sour. It's like, uh, I think they're so funny, these comedians. Um, and I got a call afterwards uh, from a guy with Australia to die. Australia to die. He said, we're doing a a show in, in Western Canada. And he's like, uh, they're doing their, their, they're doing their remote, well, Australia Today is like their big morning show and they're coming to Canada. They say, well, we're filming in Western Canada. And they say, we'd like to have you on and taking a piss out of Canadians. And he said, um, we're gonna be filming, it. we're filming in Victoria, Vancouver, and Banff. <laughs> now, I live in Calgary. And they said, no, what's convenient for you? <laughs> I was about to answer. And he said, cause we'll fly in, put you up. I said, Victoria, uh, definitely. <laughs> From Calgary, yeah. Yeah, Victoria would probably, so they put me up at the Empress Hotel. <laughs> they flew me in for a two-minute spot, two minutes. Anyway, so I'm doing the interview, and they sent me a CD later. And you know there's something that scrolls along the bottom. So as I'm talking, it scrolls along the bottom, and it says, Will Ferguson, author of Why I Don't Like Canadians. So, <laughs> so the Australians couldn't do it. Like, no, they just can't, they can't do it. The follow-up to that book was uh, How to Be a Canadian which I wrote with my brother Ian. That was accidental because I had been commissioned to write a book, a humorous book on the Canadian Senate. You know, funny stories. Turns out there are no funny stories about the, it just took a lot of money, didn't do anything. Took a lot of money, didn't do anything. Took a lot of money, didn't do anything. It's just very repetitive anecdotes. And I was desperate to get out of the contract. And uh, we've got, a, I'm assuming a room of writers here, because um, you'll appreciate this. Uh, I called up, I couldn't do it. I called up the publisher. It was, I'd moved to Douglas and McIntyre. Uh, M&S had been moved to some other publisher. And uh, I called up Scott McIntyre, who was the McIntyre in Douglas McIntyre. And I said, I can't do it. I can't. And he said, well, it's fine, Will. Just return the advance. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that advance was gone. That was gone. Be that was spent before it arrived. So the idea of asking an author that you'd still have the advance just kicking around, like, oh, here it is. I haven't even cashed it yet. <laughs> what am I saying? Like, no, that money was gone. I was spent before the check arrived. So I was, like, doomed. And I was in a bookstore opening here in Calgary at the South. Remember there was an Indigo at the Southland Mall? There's this big Indigo there. It's, uh, now it's like a bed, bath, and beyond or something. 
I, I know because I pulled up like Paul Newman in The Color of Money going into the pool hall and finding out it was a laundromat. I walked in like, where the hell is the bookstore? It's all like, uh, and I thought, wow, Heather Reisman's really gone overboard with the gifting here. It's like, <laughs> I couldn't find any books at all. I went right to the back. Anyway, um, at the time though, they were opening this bookstore, Indigo, and Margaret Atwood was there. And uh, she came up to me, uh, well, I introduced myself, I should say. And she said, oh, she's got that great voice. Uh, it's like a, like a film noir, femme fatale voice. You fit into me like a hook in an eye, you know, that voice. And um, she said, you're the one who hates Canadians. And I was like, no, no, it's, it's a humorous, humorous book. And she said to me, you should, there was a uh, writer uh, named George Mikey's, a Hungarian writer in the 1950s. He wrote a book called How to Be an Alien, explaining England to foreigners. And she said, you should do a book on how to be a Canadian. I thought, well, that's not a bad idea. So I called back Scott, and I said, Scott, okay, forget the Senate book. He said, forget the Senate book. You're under contract. No, no, forget it. I've got a better idea. I'm going to write a guidebook, how to be a Canadian. And he's like, well, Will, we commissioned you. He said, Margaret Atwood uh, suggested it. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that's really uh, great to put on any, let, uh, as recommended by Margaret Atwood. I recommend you, s you use that. Uh, because you could hear his eyes go boing on the phone, and he's like, Margaret Atwood, really? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, she's been like, we were brainstorming ideas. And <laughs> <laughs> she's been really bugging me to write this book. I talked to her for like two minutes, probably. Um, and he's like, do you think she'd write an introduction? I'm like, why not, <laughs> right? And you'll notice there is no introduction by Margaret Atwood to the book, but on the back cover it says, in big letters, as suggested by an idea by Margaret Atwood. <laughs> so uh, we milked her name. Uh, and I, I, I wrote that with my brother Ian, uh, who has a background in comedy. Uh, he ran the Poor Alex Theater in, in Toronto. And if anyone who know, has connections in Edmonton, uh, he, ha he was one of the co-founders of the Varscona Cinema, of Varscona Theater, and he started the Dynasty Improv. So he, it's still going. He's moved on. But So Ian had a background in comedy, and I asked him um, uh, to write the book with me. So Ian and I wrote it together, and uh, it was poignant. He was my older brother, and, but he hadn't written a book before, so he was relying on me. And uh, so I thought, there has to be a way to exploit this. You know, there has to be a way to take advantage of him. So we divided the book up by chapters, and it was really funny. He was so keen. And uh, I, he shows up, because to me it was a contractual, contractual obligation, this book. This was like a, and uh, he'd show up. He had a big stack of papers on curling, for example. There'd be post-it notes and stickers and possible punchlines, and... And he'd say, okay, I'll do a book on sports. And I said, okay, I'll do a book on how the Canadian government works. And he says, good, 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 good. So we met up, and he had this big stack of papers about curling, and it was really you know, all these notes. And, and I put my chapter down, how the Canadian government works. Two words, it doesn't. <laughs> and I was like, and I said, ah, I'm done for the day, man. I'm, that was a, and he's like, what the hell, you can't do that. I, so here's a tip, if you have a co-author, you want to divide it by word count. <laughs> Not by chapter, because I said, that's, and that is a chapter in the book. That's an entire chapter, uh, how the Canadian government works. It doesn't. That was my chapter. That was mine. <laughs> so the chapter on curling, the 50 pages on curling, that's Ian. Um, so that, and what happened was, after that, is McLean's offered me a, a regular column, kind of political satire column, and I didn't want to do it, because I, even how to be a Canadian, I just kind of, I felt like I, I was kind of forcing this through. Um, so I wouldn't have to write about the Senate. And I counter and I asked them if I could write a travel column. And so I, I, I'm, I, I was better at negotiating. So they, they'd offered me a, a, like a one page kind of humor satire, what's wrong with Canada. And I thought I kind of said my piece already. I already felt I'd already said what I wanted to say. So I wanted to do a travel column about Canada. So they, they would send me across Canada like to Yukon and Labrador, places that I always wanted to go. And I would write a column uh, every two weeks. Um, my editor was Pierre Burton's nephew, named Burton Woodward, was the editor. And he said, do you want to meet Pierre? Because Pierre at Burton had read uh, How to Be a Canadian. I said, yeah, I'd love to meet Pierre Burton. Wow. So I went out to his place in Kleinberg. And uh, it was great. He was, he was very, you know, very frail, but still very sharp. This is like, like just a few years before he died. And uh, it was hilarious because uh, he would show me around the house, his yard in Kleinberg, beautiful yard, and he would tell me, stuff, and his wife Janet would then tell me what really happened. So he would say, you see all these, there were no trees here, Will, I planted every one of these trees. She'd say, oh, he hired somebody to come in and plant those. So they would <laughs> go back and forth, and, uh, and Pierre said to me, you're writing a column for McLean's, because he used to edit McLean's. He was one of the original editors. I think one of the founding editors, I think, maybe. Um, and uh, he, actually a, a story about 
Pierre Burton uh, f that you can take away as a negotiating tool is when they, when they offered him, I think it was maybe Wes McLean's to become the editor in chief, they said, we're thinking for salary, we're thinking twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And he said, I'll take the 30000 <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought, good, good tip. If you ever get a range, you just... But Pierre said to me, put your name in the column, that way they can't fire you. So it was called uh, Will Ferguson's Canada. Turns out he's wrong. They can <laughs> fire you. Um, I expense accounted a trip uh, helicopter ride in Churchill, Manitoba. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been on an expense account, and uh, so you try to slip a fast one in, so you're like, breakfast, uh, taxi to the airport, luggage. You know, you try to do something. So I was like, taxi to the airport, helicopter ride. <laughs> because I went up to Churchill and I realized that I couldn't get w to the fort. There's a big British fort up there and you can't get to it in the winter because there's polar bears everywhere. So I had to fly over in a helicopter and I, uh, I don't write for McLean's anymore. Um, because they, they called me up, the editor said, Will, what's going on? I said, we had a contract that said I could charge reasonable travel expenses. He said, you charge $900 for a, ta for a helicopter. I said, for a helicopter, very reasonable. I got a good <laughs> deal. It was originally 1200 I got a reasonable deal on that. But what came out of writing for McLean's, the regular column for McLean's, and it was great because I got to go up Nootka Sound and uh, uh, I got to just travel on my own. Um, is that I started to become kind of the guy. I didn't, never intended this, the kind of the, this Canadiana guy. It was kind of odd. And I got a phone call from uh, Kim Itzo, who i known in film school. We knew each other in film school, and she was now, at that time, the managing editor at Flair Magazine, the features editor. And um, she called me up and she said, Will, uh, I was talking to Suzanne Boyd, the publisher. We want to send you all expenses paid to a beauty spa. I was like, yes, where am I going? Like Tahiti, the French Riviera, Moose Jaw. I said, we're gonna send you to Moose Jaw, <laughs> Saskatchewan. Turns out there's this beautiful natural hot spring in Moose Jaw, I did not know this. There's this, so they sent me there. They said, we're gonna do the whole works for you, like the entire spa treatment. And I was, great. And I was about to hang up, and you should never wanna do this if you've ever got an assignment from an editor, just take it, just accept it. But I said, why me, like why? And she said, this is her direct quote. She said, we thought it would be funny to send the most clued out man that we know. <laughs> the least metrosexual male that we can think of. That's her words, the least metrosexual male that we can think of. And I was like, so they sent me to, to Moose Jaw and uh, they did the full, the full shebang on it. Um, I don't know, they wrapped me in tea leaves and dunked me in herbal tea and they and it's very indecisive beauty is very indecisive I have three sisters I kind of understand them now it's because it's it's like the karate kid they would wipe something on and then they'd immediately change their mind and then wipe it back off again <laughs> and there's like they're polishing her face and um and they, they gave a, a, a full massage and a mud pack and here's the thing this is for the gentleman in the audience um if the loved one in your life sends you to a spa and you go to the spa and they ask you, do you want extractions? <laughs> I love this because the women go, oh, and the men are going, what, 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 what? <laughs> the correct answer is no, God, no, for the love of God, no. That's the correct answer. And I love it because the guys are going, like, what, the, what, what, I don't know, what's an extraction? So here's what an extraction, you think I'm making this up, but the women will back me up. I'm not making this up. This exists in the world. Uh, they, they come in, I said, do you want extraction? I'm like, uh, sure. <laughs> they come in, they have this big, like, magnifying glass on your face and they look at your pores, and they pop all your zits. They go through, this is someone's job. This is, they, they pop your zits for you. No, 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 they were, they were, she was doing something with her hands, she was popping it. It was awful. Don't defend extractions, there's no defense for that. Nice try. Well, I don't, maybe she was using a tool that was still popping your zits. So that's what, um, and then they sent me in to uh, uh, reflexology. I don't know if you know reflexology, but um, I'm very dubious about reflexology because it's, uh, you go in, they've got a big map of a human foot, and it's not a good map because there's like liver and kidney, and I don't know where my liver is. I, do, I, do, I think it's up here, but I, I don't think it's in my foot. And they bring in a, uh, what do you call it? A man. <laughs> and he's like, hi, I'm Brad. I'm your reflexologist. And then he turns the lights down low and... Uh, puts on soft music, he lights scented candles, and he starts oiling up his hands like this. And he, start, and he starts massaging my feet, and he's like, You're, you seem very tense. And I was like, yeah. And my voice dropped, it was weird. I was like, do you see the game last night? Pretty good, pretty good sports game on the television. 
Um, what came out of that encounter uh, was a book called Beauty Tips for Moose Jaw. And that, that uh, it was still one of my, my better received uh, travel books. It was a collection of travel books about that. And I got a call from, it was published in the UK. I'm never getting through this. Uh, I was published in the UK and um, the British uh, uh, editor called me up. I said, I have a question about some of your uh, Canadianisms. And she goes, uh, you mentioned, like she would say, you mentioned um, uh, Tim Horton. Who, who is this Tim Horton you speak so highly of? <laughs> and I thought, well, how on earth, how do you, how do you explain Tim Horton? Uh, he's a hockey player who made donuts. It's as good as it gets. <laughs> he's an icon. He's a god among men. You can't get better than that in Canada <laughs> than a hockey player made donuts. And then she'd say, I remember she asked me, you mentioned a loony. Now I can tell from the context it's, a, um, it's money. Why is it called a loony? I said, oh, oh, because if you hold up the coin, there's a picture of a crazed woman on one <laughs> side. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, am, I am going to jump ahead, okay? I'm going to jump ahead because you guys have places to go. I'm going to jump ahead. I'm going to talk about something more practical. I'll skip the next couple of uh, uh, stories, but I want to talk about the connection between travel and fiction. So I, hopefully something practical you can take away. Um, I think I came out of a... a, a Fiction, non-fiction background. So I came out of a travel background. Um, and I remember talking with Anne Simpson, who's a poet. And she wrote, we wrote our first novel at the same time we toured together. She came out of poetry towards fiction. I came out of non-fiction. And she talked about how restrictive fiction felt. And I talked about how liberating it felt. Because you could just make things up. You could follow your imagination. You weren't confined by, by facts. Um, so it was interesting. Anne and I met at fiction, but we came at it with, I found fiction like a breath of fresh air. She found it hard to, to kind of constraining. Um, I think they're related. I think fiction and travel are related and uh, their skills, the skills cross over very easily. I use a lot of travel, write my travel writing skills in 419. I poured a lot of travel techniques into that book. Um, with travel, just like fiction, you have a protagonist, you have a journey. Hopefully you have some, some sort of transformation. Um, you reveal your characters through dialogue. Good travel writing is about vignettes, revealing vignettes and dialogue. And you're trying to capture, capture dialect character through quirks of dialogue. And that is all applicable to fiction. Um, you have a strong sense of place in travel naturally. And you want to, with travel writing, you want to evoke a place. You're not just describing it. So an um, example I always give is Blue Highways by William Least, uh, Least Heat Moon. It's a beautiful book called Blue Highways. And I remember at one point he's in North Dakota, he's driving across America, and he looks around this restaurant, he goes, it looks, it was the kind of place that looked like a, a Boy Scouts had decorated it. Like a, and I thought, that's just perfect. You can just picture your mind. He didn't go through and give a running tally. And if, it ever, if you're describing something that sounds like you're, you're, you're looking at a photograph, you're doing it wrong. If I was describing this room, I would describe maybe the lighting. I would just try to look for the telling detail. I wouldn't say there were 12 rows and there were 10 people in each row and there were five rows and there were two paintings on one side and like, you don't do that. Uh, that's bad description. And if you keep aware of when your mind wanders, when you lose attention, when you're reading, I guarantee you that most of the time it's during a descriptive passage. That's when I lose the thread of a story, when I, my mind wanders. So remember, you're looking, and, and I know it's probably common advice, but you're looking for the telling detail. And you're, trying to, you're not trying to describe a place, you're trying to evoke it because the reader has to meet you halfway. They have to bring their own sense. Like, I know what it means when you say it looked, a restaurant that looks like a band of Boy Scouts decorated it. I know what that, what that looks like. And, um, and all of that you have to do in travel writing. Travel writing is very unforgiving because it's nonfiction. You, you, you don't have a lot of, as much leeway. You have leeway, not as much as you would in fiction. Travel writing is a good entry point for writers. Um, my, my advice is always to go through the process of being published, get edited, um, get disappointed with a manageable project. So don't start with your big dream epic, really don't. I think, you're th I think that's a mistake. So start with a manageable project that you believe in. I don't mean something that, that's trite, I mean something that's small and manageable. And travel uh, offers that in spades. Um, to get published really, let's, let's be honest, uh, all, you read all the books you want, but it really boils down. You have to answer three questions. Why this? Why now? Why you? 
Those are the three questions. And why this? It has to be interesting, right? A bad idea, you can't polish a turd, as my grandma would say. Like, there's only so much you can do with a bad idea. And if, if the idea, the concept is flawed at the start, you will not succeed. It won't happen. But that goes without saying, and you'll know in your heart if it's worth it. And if you feel passionate about it, it's worth pursuing. Why now? This is one that trips up writers, but it's very easy to get around. I'll tell you a trick about that. Because why now? And I'm thinking magazine as well. Magazine, newspaper pitches, not necessarily books. Books as well, but I'm talking nonfiction. And uh, what you do with why now? Because they want to know, is, is it topical? What they're really asking, is this topical? So you go to the bookstore, you go to the library, and you look up similar books that what you're writing. And here's the beauty of it. It doesn't matter if there's a lot of books or there's no books. You just use that to your advantage. So there's a lot of books. You say, see, this is a burning topic. A lot of people are writing about it. And um, yeah, are we OK? Can I five more minutes? I've got five, five minutes? OK. I'll try to get through the actual useful stuff. I wasted too much time. Um, so th the question trips up a lot of authors is why now? And if there's a lot of magazine articles on that topic or a lot of books, you say, see, this is a, uh, this is a topic that, that resonates with readers. Use that word, by the way. They love the word. I don't know why. Resonates with readers. They love that phrase. And uh, if there's no books and no magazines and no articles, you say, see, this is a need that hasn't been met. <laughs> so you can't lose. Like that, that's actually an easy question to lose. A lot of writers get tripped up on that one. That's the easiest one to learn to use. The hardest one when you're starting out is why you? Why should you write this? Why I hate Canadians? Because I spent five years in Japan and I came back and this was my story. And in a sense, Why I Hate Canadians was a travel story. No, you couldn't write that. Nobody here could write that story because that was my story. And I can't write your story. This is the beauty of nonfiction. Um, and, uh, da, 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 da. and also the other beauty too is that, of course, is that you don't have to write the whole book like you do in fiction. And I'll just quickly wrap it up. Um, the pay is terrible. Uh, in, in travel writing, it's just awful. You don't do it for the money. Uh, you do it for, you, you can travel, you get, if you can get on the junkets, you can, you can do travel writing junkets, which are, which are fun, but mainly you're doing it for the experience and the discipline of integrating all those elements, descriptive, expository dialogue into something which you can apply to fiction or to other nonfiction. When I started out 20 years ago, I, my first uh, publication was 1997. Uh, it was a dollar a word. 20 years later, it's still a dollar a word. I can't think of any other field where there has the, the pay has not gone up in 20 years. So I'm kind of appalled. Um, but travel writing does give you that because it's your story. And travel writing, you don't have to ride a, you know, ride a kangaroo across Australia or, or you know, go across the Amazon in a canoe. It's your story. It can be as something as simple as, as going out to the suburbs you grew up with as a child and realizing that they've changed. It's the idea of a travel story is its place and it's you, and only you can, can write that. And only you can answer um, that third question. I think I'm going to leave there because you all have events starting up at 4 o'clock. I don't, we have time for one question or no questions? I think we probably should wrap. We'll wrap it up? Yeah. So if you had a really great, great question, just hold it inside you. <laughs> let it ferment <laughs> bitterly. Uh, have a great conference. I hope the rest of it goes well. Uh, and keep writing. Keep your chin up. Thanks.